شيخ شريف شيخ أحمد وحوه لي تضاوات هي سجال عود حسن شيخ محمود وحوه لي بغل هي سجال شيخ وحان سير رسمي أقول لواقع إن مدن حسن شيخ محمود ويا هاي ملحوينا جمهورية الحمراك الشمال Assalamu alaikum. Welcome to the briefing room. I'm your host, Abu Hamza. What you just saw was the announcement of Hassan Sheikh Mahmoud as the new president of the Somali Republic on September 10th, 2012. In the first round, he beat the more well-known presidential candidates that were running along with him, such as the then Prime Minister, Abdul Muhammad Ali, now former Speaker of Parliament, Sharif Hassan Sheikh Aden, Former Prime Minister Mohammed Abdullahi Mohammed, better known as Fermajo, Professor Mohammed Abdawali, Sheikh Yusuf Dered, journalist Yusuf Garat Umar, and Professor Ahmed Ismail Samatar. In the second round of voting, he beat the incumbent president of the transitional federal government, Sheikh Sharif Sheikh Ahmed, winning by 190 votes to 79. He was immediately sworn in as the new president by the Speaker of the House, Mohammed Usman Jawari. He then appointed a new Prime Minister on the 6th of October 2012, Abdi Farah Shirdan, who was put in charge of selecting a new and lean cabinet. Most of the key figures in this new government, including the Prime Minister, most members of cabinet and those advising him in the office of the presidency, are pretty new to the political governance of Somalia. They've been in the political system, but they're pretty new to the cabinet, the majority of them. The majority of those that dominated the TFG are now no longer in government, including those that were involved with the roadmap for Somalia and the forming of the provisional constitution that was adopted on August 1st, 2012 by the Somali parliament. On September 26th, 2012, 16 days after having been elected by the Somali parliament, President Hassan Sheikh outlined his plans for the next four years at the IOM, IOM Council. That's the International Office for Migration. He called it New Beginnings, a Six-Pillar Policy Framework. Here's the clip. This is why the six pillar policy framework, which I outlined when I came to the office, is playing a central role in my administration. My administration's goal over the next four years is to put place the necessary mechanism to create stability in the country, speed up economic recovery, build peace and remove the main drivers of conflict, vastly improve the government's capacity to respond to the needs of its people by improving service delivery, increase our international partnership and create closer ties with our neighbors and friends of Somalia. Last but not least, Mr. Chairman, I believe that unity at home is what, were, what will propel Somalia forward. Okay, so those were his six pillars, what he was going to look forward to in his first term. Let's look at the first pillar, stability in the country regarding rule of law and justice. When talking about the rule of law in Somalia, you know, when, when thinking of the judicial system, it is hard not to think about the most prominent case in the judiciary's recent history. It is the rape case that gripped Somalis around the world. It started when a young 27-year-old Somali woman accused five government soldiers of raping her. The journalist who interviewed her, along with her and her husband and others involved in this interview, were arrested on January 10th, 2013, on charges of you know, insulting a government body and inducing false evidence. It was the international community, including Somalis worldwide, that condemned the prosecution's case. When the Somali president was interviewed by Al Jazeera about this case, during his visit to Doha, he answered, journalists are Somali citizens. There is no special law for journalists. But I will go back to Somalia and ask why he is still jailed. The issue of our justice system, we do not deny. It's weak. At the same time, our financial systems are weak, our security systems are weak. But this is what we have. We are in the process of reforming, particularly the judicial system, which is a priority and a process is going on. After which, when he was asked about the criticism 
he received regarding how the government handled this case, he responded, the woman issue for us is a national issue. This is a single case. Women are a part of Somali society and that is suffering. They suffer as every Somali citizen has suffered. Of course, they are vulnerable. They are weak and they are a priority for us. We are very much committed to protect the rights of women, the rights of all vulnerable members of our society. Now, I wouldn't necessarily agree that you know, our Somali women are weak, but they are definitely vulnerable, especially in IDP camps. Alhamdulillah, now, the journalist and the rape victim were both cleared of all charges after a court appeal and released in March. Now, without going in too deep about the government's involvement in the case, it is p painfully clear that the government has a long way to go to ensuring the judiciary is strong, fair and independent. Could the president have handled the situation better? Perhaps. I mean, I agree with his sentiment that the justice system needed to be let to run its course. However, what really needs to be addressed is the attitude of the Attorney General's office and the police. They should have not only been looking into the victim and the journalist, but what they should have been doing is they should have been looking into, into the alleged crime. That is what should have been investigated for justice to be served. And after they were released, I mean, everybody was so jubilant about the release of the journalist and the rape victim that right now, very little of any pressure has been put on the government and the president to follow up on this allegation and ensure that those responsible for that specific crime are arrested and prosecuted. Like the case of the guy who you will see the president commenting on in the following clip. Uh, regarding the, the rule of law and the rape, the case of rape in Somalia has always been there. It is a very serious problem. And for me, it's one of my priority to eliminate the rape case. And recently, we have established a task force that addresses the elimination of the rape. rape. Recently, as you heard, the courts of law in Somalia has Take it, has sentenced to death a man who raped a very, very young girl of seven years old and who publicly announced, uh, 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 admitted that he did this in public. That man was sentenced to death and he was executed. Well, there are so many people who said he was not supposed to execute, but according to the law in Somalia and according to the Sharia that we are applying now, that was the punishment. Seven years old girl, and she is disabled for the rest of her life. And the man has proven to, that was not the only case he did, but in the past, he himself admitted that he did a lot of cases like that. So my government has a zero tolerance on the rape issue. We Perhaps the only way to convict a rapist in Somalia is when he confesses. I don't know. Aside from that, what other areas of the rule of law need to be focused on? The obvious part is security. There are constant guerrilla attacks by Al-Shabaab. And the biggest statement that they made was made when they attacked the Mogadishu Regional Court Complex. And among those killed when the assailants opened fire inside the court complex, complex were the respected lawyers, Professor Mohammed Mahmoud Afrah, the head of the Somali Lawyers Association, and Abdi Karim Hassan Garut, who you'll see here together. They were the ones who represented the rape victim and the journalist who had interviewed the woman. Now, in Somalia, we have over 17,000 Amisom troops in the country. And we also have the Somali National Army, who's aiding the effort. But until now, there's no exit strategy has been agreed yet, and the president has a long way to go to ensure that the Somali security forces are built up to such a point that Amazon is no longer needed. This was President Hassan Sheikh's first and foremost pillar of a six-pillar policy. And in his first year of term, in my opinion, there has not been much leeway made in practical terms. The second pillar is economic recovery. Now let's try to understand what is involved in the Somali economy and then we can look at what the president has done to help the economy recover. The biggest aspects of our economy are our agriculture, remittances and the telecoms industry. The Somali livestock industry accounts for a large part of Somalia's GDP and total exports. Despite some trade embargoes, 
the livestock continues to be Somalia's largest traded commodity, with the main markets for Somali livestock being on the Arabian Peninsula, as well as Kenya, Djibouti and Ethiopia. This is because Somalis have a unique advantage to serve the Middle East with halal livestock products. But then also, they have a unique advantage to supply the international markets with organic meat produce. On top of that, the fishing industry also has huge potential, can become a great source of income. However, to ensure this happens, the government needs to invest or facilitate investment in that agricultural industry to ensure it flourishes. So far, the president and his government have done little to develop this further. One key aspect it needs to focus on is the prevention of another famine during a drought period to avoid what happened in the summer of 2011. Also, deforestation and charcoal export to Middle Eastern countries is one of the major causes of, causes of environmental degradation in Somalia. In recent years, illegal cutting of trees to produce charcoal for export has become a booming business with considerable profits. Most of the charcoal is prepared in southern Somalia and, ex and exported through the ports in Mogadishu and Kutsmayo. The government has said that they support the ban of charcoal exports, but have done little in practical terms to ensure this happens. The Somali telecom industry has been okay. I mean, it's been, it's been flourishing. It's been one of the fastest growing industries in Africa. And it's been doing so without a proper government. And it continues to do so with little influence by the current government. So no change there, really. But what is worrying, though, is that the country relies heavily on remittances. And if the government tackles the root causes, such as building a form of financial infrastructure, improving the unemployment rates, and creating a better healthcare system, the single decisions of a few Western banks to close the accounts of remittance companies wouldn't have such a huge impact on the whole country. Until the president does, we will continue to be dependent on these remittances to survive and even pay salaries. But that was the telecom, the agricultural industry, remittances, what about energy and oil? The foreign investment is a priority area. And when our parliament get back to the business in March, early March, one of those bills that the government is going to table is the investment law of Somalia. We want to put in place the investment law that protects the right of the investors and give us guarantee that this is their, their, their right. If, so that in, that in, what makes us do that is we believe that the reconstruction of the country will mainly be done by the private people. As of now in Mogadishu, a week ago when I was leaving, there are two major projects that already have started. One is the real estate project whereby 500 houses will be built in Mogadishu by private companies, Somali co private companies. And this is an area where Somali business people are good. We have seen the real estate in Nairobi, in Juba, in Dubai, and the role of the Somali, Somali business community has did that. So they, we allocated a piece of land where 500 houses will be built soon. And they told me, those, the, the owners of that company, that many of these houses are already sold by the diaspora, to the diaspora. So that's one. The other is the uh, power plant in Mogadishu, whereby a Somali company is constructing a 50 megawatt power system, costing one, 70 to 100 million dollars where today the power, the price of the power in Mogadishu is $1.2 per kilowatt, one of the most expensive energy in the world, $1.2 per kilowatt. These guys, their business plan indicates that it will, they will bring down to 0.28 per kilowatt. So see the difference. If that is realized, industrialization and everything is possible. Hmm. Public-private partnerships. On that note, in May this year, both the Minister for Natural Resources, Abdel Rassak Umar Mohammed, and President Hassan Sheikh Mohammed said that they would not, they would not 
sign any oil deals until the petroleum bill and the new constitution were made compatible. I mean, that's what they said. That is now no longer the case. Because they've recently signed a new oil deal with the newly formed company Soma Oil and Gas. Don't let the, the name fool you, it's not owned by Somalis. The government said that Lord Howard's high profile, the former leader of, Britain, of Britain's Conservative Party, was critical to agreeing the deal. The agreement stipulated that Soma could apply for up to 12 oil blocks in return for undertaking the survey and handing over the data to the government. Lord Howard said, in consideration for doing the survey, we want to be able to go in and get exploring in front of the pack, stating that Soma would have first dips on the most prospective blocks turned up by his survey. Again, it's outside companies getting more out of this than the Somalis themselves. I mean, Lord Howard obviously is on the, on the committee, the governing board of the company. So make sure to join us after the break as we continue our review of Somali President Hassan Sheikh's first year in office. For any government, it's of utmost importance that it can provide the services that its citizens need. President Hassan Sheikh's fourth pillar is to focus on government capacity to improve service delivery. I'll use a few examples that show the progress he has made on this, or that his government has made on this. Earlier this year, the Ministry of Human Development and Public Services, together with UNICEF, proposed the Go to School initiative. The reason is because Somalia has one of the world's lowest enrollment rates for primary school aged children. According to statistics published in the Joint Strategy document for the Go to School initiative, 42% of children are in school. Of those, only 36% are girls. The number of out of school and at risk children and youth aged between 6 to 18 has been estimated at 4.4 million. That's out of a total population of 9.2 million. The initiative aims to get 1 million children and youth who are currently out of school in, a, in Somalia, literally, to go to school. Other aspects of the initiative are to improve the national education framework and improve the teaching standards across the country. The Go to School initiative will cost $117 million over three years and it's mainly supported by key donors like the EU, USAID, UK DFID and the government of the Netherlands, as well as the Global Partnership for Education funding, which will probably fill some of the funding gaps. The Go to School initiative is advocated for and coordinated by UNICEF. It's ambitious and can have a huge impact. Taking on programs as big as this will give the Somali government the experience required to be able to further develop its capacity. It does, however, show that the government currently cannot provide the services and cannot provide the service delivery for these young people on its own yet. But through these partnerships and through investment, they are slowly strengthening their capacity it's positive steps forward. During a visit to London, the Minister for Human Development and Public Services, Dr. Mariam Qasim, was asked about the teaching resources required from the diaspora. Here's the clip. The youngsters who want to come back to Somalia, whether it's uh, one year or three months or six months, yes, we accept because we know the situation in Somalia is really very difficult. And whoever is offering something, whether it's three months or one year, we want. We want everything that we can get. And there will be some kind of uh, coordination for those who want to come back. It's not just that they just come and go to Somalia. There will be a system in place, coordination, for those who want to volunteer and come back. Again, um, training, yes, for, for the teachers that we have now in Somalia, for the old teachers, we are giving them a short training, and they start with that, and also for, 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 for we have in Somalia, youth who finish secondary schools, we will use them, give them training, they can teach, at the primary education. Also, we have in Somalia those, some who finish the universities, we will use them. But again, it's not enough. All of those are not enough. Just it is um, like um, doing whatever is doable. So anybody who can volunteer, whether it's one year, three months, whatever, it's really great. 
it is not enough. I agree. But she's right. Whatever help can be given will be well received. See, I like that. Using all the resources available to you. Utilizing Somalis to help other Somalis. Another key aspect of this initiative is that it's across the board. It involves Somaliland, Pinland and the SFG working together to improve our children's education. We still have a long way to go. Yes, especially when it comes to healthcare and welfare. But education is key. But that was a quick overview of the public services in Somalia. But what about the Somali waters and the piracy and toxic waste dumping issues? At the end of July this year, the Minister of Defence, Abdi Hakim Mahmoud Haji Faqi, for the Federal Government of Somalia has signed a contract with the Atlantic Marine and Offshore Group for what they say is to deliver structure, assets and services in order to develop an effective and sustainable Coast Guard in Somalia. So what does this include? Well, it includes monitoring and surveillance of the exclusive economic zone, patrolling, controlling and securing the exclusive e economic zone, securing trade in ports, protecting natural resources, protection of fishing grounds from illegal foreign fishing boats, prevention of dumping of toxic materials, and search, rescue, and anti-smuggling services. The Atlantic Marine and Offshore Group will develop a Coast Guard training center to train the Somali Coast Guard personnel, security officers, and shore-based support personnel. Now, whilst the country needs a Coast Guard, you know, uh, it does. I'm not sure if it's wise to sign this to be outsourced to an external, non-Somali company so quickly though. I mean, okay, yes, the training of the Somali Coast Guard is, however, another small step forward towards improving the government capacity for service delivery. Okay, so what do we have? We have the Coast Guard having been outsourced, healthcare has not been improved much, and the management of Mogadishu's airport has also been outsourced to SKA International Group, you know, the Dubai-based logistics firm. So out of all of that, it's only really the go-to-school project that is Somali-led, even if it's coordinated and supported by international entities. One out of four. Again, it's a small step forward, but nowhere near to achieving this specific pillar. Geopolitics is a key aspect of governing any country. So the president's fifth pillar of improving international partnerships and closer ties with neighbors and allies is definitely needed. The biggest announcement of this was probably the following. I am delighted to announce that for the first time since 1991, the United States is recognizing the government of Somalia. Okay, so the Americans have recognized the Somali government, but what about the British? They have hosted two conferences on Somalia in London and have constantly held a relationship with all the transitional governments. Here's the foreign minister. This is the first time that the United Kingdom will have had a permanent presence here since 1991 and that we are able to reopen it today is testimony to the progress Somalia has made in the last few years. It's a symbol of our enduring commitment to the future of Somalia. Soon we will be hoping and expecting that different flags will be flying in different parts of Mogadishu and the government of Somalia is actively engaged on realizing that goal soon. Okay. Thank you. So the British and the Americans have given their support and Somalia also has seats in the United Nations, the African Union and Organization of Islamic Cooperation. These are some of the basics of any sovereign country in today's world, which is good. So how many countries have embassies in Somalia? Currently, it's Djibouti, Ethiopia, Iran, Libya, Sudan, Turkey, Uganda, the UK and Yemen. Egypt, Italy, South Korea and the UAE are also scheduled to open their embassies there soon. The rest of the world have what they call non-resident embassies for Somalia, of which the majority is either located in Addis Ababa or Nairobi. And it's with these two neighboring countries, Kenya and Ethiopia, that the president needs to develop special relationships with. Both Kenya and Ethiopia can be our allies, yes, but their influence in our internal politics, in my opinion, is currently too great. The president hasn't made any significant steps towards strengthening the country's independence away from them and relying on Kenya and Ethiopia to help us resolve our internal disagreements probably isn't the, be isn't the best strategic move if we want to ensure they have less influence in our politics. I agree, the president has improved international relations but as far as I can see, our ties with our neighboring countries are still too close. We, we need to take a step back. The Somali president 
wants to focus on national unity as well as peace building and removing the main drivers of conflict. These two pillars interlink and these are mainly the internal aspects of peace building between the Somalis themselves. So who do they have to reconcile with? Pretty much everyone in the Somali Peninsula. Let's start off with Juba land. The Somali government has been having a conflict with the current leadership of the administration of the Juba land regions. It's the legitimacy of that leadership is what they contested most. But the conflict between these two resulted, resulted in the needless death and injury of hundreds of innocent Somalis. But we're very grateful they have recently signed the Juba Agreement and I'll cover a few of its articles. In the first article of the Juba Agreement, they agreed on having an interim administration for Juba land and that the duration of the interim administration shall be of a period of not more than two years, during which, and subject to the constitutional process, a permanent federal member state will be established. Article 2 states that the Kismaya Airport and Kismaya Seaport shall be utilized in a, in a manner that is beneficial to the peace and prosperity of the people of Somalia under the leadership and management of the federal government of Somalia. This also includes that the management handover needs to take place within the six month period. In Article 3, they agree that all security elements, including Raskamboni Brigade, the Darwish, and any other militias, shall be integrated into the central command of the Somali National Army. And the regional police will be under the command of the interim Juba administration. In Article 4, they agreed that the federal government of Somalia shall organize and convene within two weeks a reconciliation conference in Mogadishu. A follow up peace building conference will also be held in Kismayo. Now, during these peace building conferences and reconciliation conferences, they will discuss how to develop federal member states and they'll discuss the comp completion of the formation of the interim administration of Jubaland. So this is definitely a positive step forward, right? Because it's important to come to compromises. But with every compromise and step forward, you have to consider the wider impact. Immediately following the Jubba agreement, Bay and Bakol leaders held a meeting in Bay Dabo and announced that federal government officials are barred from arriving in the Bay region. A well-known traditional elder, Malak Ali Mu'min, said we have withdrawn our support from the Somali federal government in Mogadishu. We call on parliamentarians and other federal government officials hailing from this region to come back. The Somali president made progress with Jubaland, but now faces the same issue with Bay and Bakal. Punland is on the verge of cutting ties with the Somali government. Or, or they have cut ties with the Somali government now. Over allegations that the constitution has been tampered with. It's like the Somali president takes one step forward, but is forced two steps back. The Somali government has also continued talks with Somaliland. And again, that's a good thing. And the last meeting was in Istanbul on July 7th. They only had two real points that were agreed on in the final communique. And the first one was that these type of talks should continue. And the second one was that they agreed to the return of the air traffic management from the UN and decided to establish a joint control body that is based in Hargeisa to lead the air traffic control of both sides. Again, President Hassan Sheikh's government is making positive steps towards reconciliation. But these are still the initial, initial steps. Positive, but it's the start. In his first year, President Hassan Sheikh has neither strengthened nor weakened his relations with Somaliland. He faces threatening action from Bay and Bakal and Puntland. And although an important step, Little has been achieved in practical terms regarding the Juba Agreement. When it comes to these specific pillars of his six-pillar policy, the Somali President Hassan Sheikh Mahmoud is nowhere near to achieving this yet. There are many things we haven't discussed on this program, including IDPs, corruption allegations, the efficiency of the Somali Parliament, the provisional constitution, and many more things. See, what I wanted to do was I wanted to cover the plans the President set out in his framework and review his progress during his first year. So far, I don't see much improvement in many areas, but I see some good development in others. He has three more years, and his most important legacy, in my opinion, will probably be ensuring the implementation of the one-man, one-vote policy. Mr. President, I hope you do, but the signs are not looking good so far. I am your host, Abu Hamza, and thank you for watching The Briefing Room.